Thanks, Jerry. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Jerry in particular for his fantastic support, uh, not just during this week, um, but over the last couple of years for everything we're doing at Galactic. Uh, we've had a ball the last couple of days. It's been a fantastic festival, uh, and uh, nice to see some, some friendly faces in the, front seat, in the front rows there. Managed to get out of belly up and here this morning, which is some achievement. Uh, and uh, I also noticed somebody that looks uncannily like my boss sitting in the back row, but hopefully he's not here. Um, so, uh, let me just start with a show of hands. Um, who, at some point in their life, dreamt about going to space? Fantastic. Who thinks they will go to space? And who, if price wasn't an option and you knew you would come back safely, would go to space? <laughs> That's pretty much everybody, which is fantastic. You know, this is one of the most remarkable projects that's going on in the world today. Um, and uh, I really like this picture, and I often start showing it to show it when I start uh, talking about Galactic, because it sort of looks pretty ordinary. But actually, it's probably one of the most phenomenal pictures you will ever see, um, because it, it shows three things which have never existed before. The first thing, uh, right on the left there, is the corner of Spaceport America, just down the road from here, I guess, uh, in the, uh, the southern part of New Mexico. It's the world's first purpose-built commercial spaceport. Uh, it was designed by Foster and Partners. It is a fantastic, a beautiful building out there in the desert. It's where our future astronauts will train. It's where they'll fly to space from. And it's there. It's real. You can go and visit it if you like. The second thing, of course, uh, is that uh, whatever it is in the background, that vehicle uh, in the background, which I'll talk more about in a moment, uh, which, of course, is Virgin's brand new beautiful spaceship. It's the world's first commercial manned spaceship, uh, and it is very real. And the third thing, and perhaps this is the most important thing, is this group of people in front of the, uh, the spaceship there uh, are Virgin Galactic's future astronauts, or some of them at least. Uh, we'll talk more about our future astronauts in a little while, but uh, this is a community, a group of people who stepped up to the plate early. They come from 52 countries around the world. There are 640 of them. In fact, I think there are 642 because Richard signed up two over breakfast this morning. Uh, and uh, they um, are so important to this, to this project. But we'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, and I've left my slide thing just down there. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so this is a very, very real project. You know, I think a lot of people will have heard of Virgin Galactic, but it often will be a surprise at just how advanced we are. Um, these vehicles are real. They're flying. Uh, we fully expect the spaceship to be right in space during 2013 and for our first commercial passengers to start flying in 2014. So we are very, very close. But let me just take a step back a little bit because um, you might ask, you know, why would anybody want to do that? And it's a good question because getting to space isn't easy. Getting to space with normal people on board, keeping them safe, giving them a great experience, hopefully making some money out of it is very, very hard. And as I've been at this uh, company, I've been here for about eight and a half years now, I think it's defined for me more than anything else as that it's just so important to get right first time, but it's really hard to get right first time. And I think that only Virgin in some ways, you know, are capable of doing this because Virgin just has a history of loving a challenge. It's almost what Virgin exists for. And, you know, we have built one of the most incredibly diverse brands in the world by targeting industries that have become lazy or complacent or who are serving their customers badly, and we move into their space, we shake them up, and we force change. And uh, that really has been, been Virgin's history. You know, we did it with airlines, we've done it in the music business, done it really across a whole range of sectors. Uh, the airline industry is probably the one that people know best. Uh, we were at a panel session here on um, uh, Sunday afternoon, I think, when uh, four incredible people were being asked about uh, their various views on design, and they were asked about which brands you know, they, they really ad admired out there. And one, I think without prompting, said Virgin America. And that's a great example of how uh, you know, Virgin has been able to come in and just improve dramatically the customer experience by great design and a real understanding of what the customer experience should be. And if you look back, of course, in Virgin with Airlines, it started back in 1984 with uh, Virgin Atlantic um, at the time. It's slightly strange talking about this with Richard in the room, but Richard uh, was flying across the uh, Atlantic on a regular basis, hating the experience and decided he could probably do it better. 
Uh, and uh, so managed to get hold of a 747, launched Virgin Atlantic, uh, and I guess the rest is history. And at the time, it was very interesting because Marketing Week in the UK uh, did a survey and they said, this is a very strange way for a brand to evolve, you know, and we sort of doubt that you can go from a record business to an airline and take your customer base with you. And they said, in fact, we, we're going to do a survey. And so they went out to their readership and said, how many people would be willing to fly the Atlantic from London to New York on, on an aircraft with a record label, basically, on the tail? And uh, the next week, they came back and said, yep, just as we thought, 90% uh, uh, of those that responded said they wouldn't want to fly across the Atlantic on an aircraft with a record label on its tail. Uh, so Richard then wrote a letter which was published in the following week saying thank you so much for doing the research which I probably should have done before I started the airline. Uh, however, you know, if 10% of the British public are willing to fly, then I better buy some new aircraft. And, uh, and of course, uh, as I say, the rest is history. And that, 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 like so many other Virgin businesses, started with a huge challenge, you know, a belief that we could do it better. Uh, and, uh, and innovated, um, just provided great design, great customer experience, uh, and you know, created some of the most you know, fantastic com com companies in the world. We tend to uh, announce early. We tend to, to, to tell the story, warts and all. We're not always successful. Uh, uh, you know, there are one or two virgin companies which haven't quite made it, and I'm going to steal a Richard joke here, but um, one of those was one that I don't think made it to Aspen, but uh, it certainly made it to London. It was called Virgin Brides. Uh, and uh, this was a great idea for a business. Uh, it didn't work too well, and as Richard said, the trouble is we just couldn't find any customers. Uh, so moving on, um, you know, we talk about our dreams, and as well as our shorter term ambitions, we try to have fun in what we do, and try to live our lives as well, remembering that while there is always the possibility that there may be no tomorrow for us individually, there will be for the businesses and the, the customers and the people that they serve. And one of the things that we have been uh, doing in the past few years is really to understand how we can use the brand to inspire and promote uh, the pace of change that is required in order to keep our businesses successful, but also to, to make the businesses that we run sustainable in the world with as many challenges that it faces today. And we sort of sum that up that, uh, you know, we don't just play the game, but we aim to change it for good. Um, and I think that better than anything really sums up the Virgin philosophy. So let's sort of move into the air before we move into space and sort of give an example, I guess, of how we, uh, how we tend to, to use the, the brand to inspire um, the companies which are going to be very important to us in the future. And, uh, you know, let's go to airlines again. Things are going to have to change dramatically in the airline industry if we're going to be able to, to run sustainable businesses, you know, come in, into, the, into the 21st century. And, and the, the big issue, of course, is just to get more efficient aircraft. Uh, and, uh, you know, aircraft's efficiency hasn't changed dramatically in, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, they've got bigger, they've probably got safer, they've got more advanced, the, you know, the, uh, the uh, entertainment system's a lot better, but they still use vast amounts of increasingly expensive fuel. So Virgin decided a few years ago that, that it could do something which would perhaps really focus the minds of the Boeings and the Airbuses of this world to really think about how they might use modern materials, technology, modern aviation, aerospace design to build better aircraft that, that Virgin Atlantic, Virgin America and others could use in order to run better businesses, better for the customers, better for the, the business and better for the planet as well. And so we, we, uh, we had this plane built. Uh, it was called the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. Uh, it was built by a company in uh, Mojave in California that you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the next few minutes called Scaled Composites, which was led uh, by one of the world's foremost um, aerospace aviation design gurus, uh, Bert Rutan. Now, um, we built it uh, for a guy called Steve Fawcett, a good friend of Richard's, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, who I think had the world record for having more world records than anybody else. Uh, and one of the world records that he wanted to have to hold that he hadn't achieved at that point was to fly an aircraft right around the world on a single tank of fuel without stopping. And we thought this was a great opportunity you know, to, to bring adventure into the brand or to, to, to really strengthen that, that value of adventure. Uh, obviously strong links to aviation, but also to prove to, uh, to the world at large, but also to those that are in positions of power in the design and the, uh, the build of commercial aircraft, that it could be done better. Uh, so um, this aircraft was built at 100% carbon composite. It was only built for, for one, one pilot. Um, and in 2005, it, it, it did what had never done, been done before. And Steve Fawcett successfully circumnavigated the globe. Um, just one person on board, no stops, single tank of fuel. 
And, uh, and of course, you know, these lessons do get learnt. And we're now seeing aircraft like the Dreamliner, the A350, that are starting to use some of the lessons that we learnt from this aircraft and from others in the use of carbon composite materials uh, in large aircraft design and manufacture, which are dramatically starting to bring down fuel consumption. And uh, that's going to be incredibly necessary uh, as we move forward into the next decade. So what does this all have to do with space? Well, when we as a business look at all the huge challenges that we, you know, we face as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a global population, it becomes really clear, I think, that there's no silver bullet. There's no one button that you can press which is going to solve everything. But we've also been aware, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, that space really matters. And uh, if there was another button that you could turn off space today, you know, life would change very dramatically in the way that we communicate, the way that we navigate, the way that we uh, harvest foods, the way that we send goods around the world. We are incredibly dependent on space uh, for, for many of the acti activities and the uh, requirements that uh, go alongside managing the, uh, you know, the needs of a burgeoning global population. So we had always identified space as a potential area of, of business. It looked like a good commercial opportunity. I think alongside that, you know, I know that, that Richard and probably many others in this room you know, have been incredibly inspired by space, particularly during the 1960s. You know, that was, one of, I guess, one of the most remarkable decades as far as the advancement of technology is concerned uh, that we have ever seen. You know, at the beginning of the 60s, we had hardly put anything into space. By the end of the 60s, two men were walking on the moon. Uh, and it was uh, just such an inspiring 10 years for those that were living through it. And uh, you saw those incredible pictures of people uh, outside the world that we knew. Uh, they looked like they were having fun. It was certainly a very different world. You know, no gravity, amazing views, all those sort of things. And a lot of people thought, I'd like to do that. And uh, those that were young at the time, their parents, I think, were saying, you know, this is going to be possible. We've seen the pace of change. You know, this is going to continue. By 1985, you know, it's probable that most people are going to be holidaying on the moon or at least, you know, having a trip to space for a weekend or whatever it is. And, you know, for that generation, it was really, I think, very dispiriting and disappointing that as the, uh, uh, the space industry grew, it, it, became, it became even sort of increasingly exclusive. Fewer and fewer people were getting into space. They all had to belong to certain, or citizens of certain countries. Uh, they had to be super fit. They had to be super intelligent. They had to be government employees. And really, I think the, 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 the chance of you and me getting to space, you know, certainly as we, we approached the end of the uh, 20th century, was looking incredibly remote. And that's, I guess, you know, a, a cue for the, for the classic virgin business in some ways, because I said earlier, we love, a, we love a challenge. We love looking at businesses where we think we can do things better, where the public are being badly served. And Richard and others, I think, I thought, I think if they, they wanted to go to space, then probably lots of other people do as well. And we tr ought to try and do something about it. So um, back in the, uh, the 90s, Richard actually uh, registered the, the, the name Virgin Galactic and sent a team of people uh, from Virgin out to do what we'd done in the airline industry, really, which was to go and get our hands on a vehicle, uh, put the Virgin logo on it, and start sending people to space. Uh, and we very quickly found out that uh, sending people to space was not like uh, taking people from London to New York in a 747. And the, the reason for that, as many of you will know, is that there has been just an incredible lack of advancement in space launch technology you know, since the 1960s. Um, I'm really mixing my uh, superpower metaphors here. Uh, so, but we, we do have a problem. In 19, this, these are two of my favorite photos. 1961, that's the photo of Yuri Gagarin that, um, going into, uh, just launching himself into orbit or being launched into orbit. Uh, and the picture on the right uh, is a very recent Soyuz launch. Um, and it is just ex extraordinary when you think how just about everything else in the field of technology has just been transformed in that period, that it's actually pretty difficult to tell those photos apart. So when we went out and started looking for, for suitable vehicles, you know, we started to get pretty worried because it, it was evident that these type of rockets, although they're impressive, they've done an amazing job of, you know, of, of scratching the surface, surface of access to space, you know, are not vehicles we could ever seriously contemplate for a commercial business. They're incredibly expensive. You know, every time the space shuttle launched, depending on how you work out the figures, it was sort of half a billion dollars. Um, the safety record, to be honest, of manned space vehicles relative to how many people have gone to space has not been great. Uh, they're not an environmental triumph, to be honest, uh, you know, partly because they are uh, igniting huge bombs at, uh, at, at ground level. Um, and, of course, it, generally, the vehicles aren't re reusable. 
So we, uh, we came back to base scratching our heads a little, and I suppose decided by that time that we'll, we'd keep looking, but it was going to be a case of really um, trying to, to find new or nascent technologies that looked like they had broken or were going to break the, uh, the situation that we found ourselves in where we could at least see a route to uh, safe vehicles, commercially viable vehicles, and also environmentally friendly vehicles. <clears throat> and as it happened, we didn't have to wait too long. And uh, I mentioned Bert Rattan a few moments ago. He was the guy that designed the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. Uh, he is a remarkable man. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, one of the few people you can probably call um, a genius. Uh, he just understands how things fly better than most people and has a fantastic record over the last 30 or 40 of years at scale composites of just churning out experimental aircraft that are always breaking boundaries and doing it extremely well time after time after time. Now, Bert was, uh, was very aware. He was another you know, kid that grew up during the 50s and 60s. He wanted to go to space. Uh, and I think deep in his you know, psyche somewhere, he was pretty sure he could do it. Uh, but he was very busy with other things. And, uh, and then the, uh, there came along the XPRIZE. And many of you will know a little bit about the XPRIZE. And uh, the XPRIZE is actually just worth spending a moment on because uh, if you look at the history of commercial aviation, you know, the fact that we have this remarkable industry now, which is flying hundreds of millions of people around the globe safely, cheaply, uh, we take completely for granted. You know, it's happened in a very, very short period of time. You know, at the, the turn of the last century, people were still struggling with the heavier-than-air heavier powered flight concept. And the Wright brothers, the year before they actually cracked it, you know, were pretty pessimistic about the chances. I think one of them said it could be another thousand years before this was, uh, this was solved. But then within a couple of decades, you had, you know, you had aircraft everywhere, you know, many pilots around the world. And within a couple of decades after that, you, know, you, you started to see a, a, the, the, the start of a, a, a burgeoning uh, commercial aviation business, which was start taking people from one, one pl place on the globe to another. And of course, today, uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it's a transformational industry. And so, um, and, and if you look at the, the way that the, that developed, a lot of it was to do with prizes, um, Alcock and Brown, uh, the uh, Charles Lindbergh flight, of course, that uh, inspired the XPRIZE. You know, those, those flights that really sort of showed that you could do things with aircraft which people had previously doubted were incredibly important at, uh, in, in, in really sort of spurring the whole industry ahead. And so um, Bert, I think, was interested in the XPRIZE because he sort of believed, well, if it, was, you know, if it was possible to do it with commercial aviation, then perhaps the prize is the way to go with space as well. And maybe this is the time in my career where I should give it a go. Um, so along with his friend Paul Allen, who provided the funding, um, Bert Rattan put his mind to transforming manned space access. Uh, we were working on the Global Challenger at the time, and we became aware that there was this strange vehicle taking shape in the other corner of the hangar. Uh, and uh, somebody took Bert out for a couple of tequilas, I think, in, in Mojave and twisted his arm. And uh, he started to tell us what he was up to, and we got very, very excited about it. And this is not a great slide to look at from where you are, but uh, let me just explain why we got really excited. We had been looking, don't forget, for something which really changed uh, fundamentally the economics and the safety, or potential safety, of, of access to space. And the way that Bert thought about it as an aeroplane man seemed to do the trick for us. The first thing he decided to do was not to launch a rocket from the ground. You know, when you launch a rocket from the ground, you light the fuse, there's no return, you're igniting this bomb uh, at, at uh, a ground level, very heavily oxygenated air. Most of the fuel in that tower of fuel is actually designed to punch through the first few thousand feet of the atmosphere. Um, and it's pretty dangerous. You know, if anything goes wrong, you're fully committed, hard to get the people out sitting on top of that rocket. And Bert knew that if he was going to, to, to design something which could potentially take tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people to space on a regular basis, that had to change. And so he looked back into history. He was aware of the X-15 project, which uh, was an air launch project uh, back in the 1960s, uh, and decided the time was right to bring back air launch, uh, the air launch system uh, into manned space. And what we mean by that is that you know, we know how to get to the outer edges of the atmosphere very regularly, very safely, no trouble at all. You know, we call it an aeroplane. And so Bert's, Bert's view was, look, if we, if we can 
build an airplane specifically uh, to, to take a spaceship very efficiently, very quickly, uh, very safely, up to 40, 50,000 feet, um, then so many of the, the launch problems have just gone away. Because when you release your spaceship at that altitude, of course, you're already on the outer edges of the atmosphere, so you don't need this huge amount of energy to punch through the rest of the way up. The other thing is, of course, if there's anything goes amiss in those first few seconds after launch, uh, you have a winged vehicle, uh, you can dump the fuel, you can glide back to the runway, land safely, sort out of the problem, and fly again. And that in itself made this system probably thousands of times safer uh, than the ground launch systems of the past. So we loved air launch. We thought it was a fantastic concept. It was the, you know, the right time to bring it back into, into manned space. The other thing that Bert said is we're going to make this all out of carbon composites. You know, we have a lot of experience at scale in building aircraft out of carbon composites, probably the best in the world. It's light, it's incredibly strong, it's incredibly, uh, uh, it, it, it absorbs heat incredibly well. Um, and uh, so we, you know, it, it's, it's the perfect material. It's a 21st century material for a 21st century vehicle. Um, and uh, so again, we like that because it made it very fuel efficient, it made it very safe. But the thing that we liked most about Bert's design and that the, 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 the thing that showed that he was a true genius, I think, was the way that he put his mind into getting this vehicle back from out of the atmosphere, back into the atmosphere. And that is one of the biggest problems that people have been wrestling with for many years, particularly with reusable space vehicles. It's not too hard to have some sort of capsule which can just fall through the atmosphere, uh, parachutes come out, it splashes down in the sea, but you can't use it again. And it's pretty uncomfortable for the people on board as well. And so Bert knew he needed something which was going to be able to be used many, many times and was going to work every time as well. The space shuttle, of course, was a reusable vehicle. The problem with the way that the space shuttle came back from orbit was that it, it, it flew back, uh, and it meant you had to have a very, very exact trajectory. If, uh, you, were too, uh, if, if you were too steep, um, then too much heat would be built up in the, in the re-entry, uh, which would cause uh, a failure of the, of the, uh, of the shuttle. And uh, if you were too shallow, then effectively you would bounce off the atmosphere back into space. So no pilot could fly that trajectory, so computers had to do it. And of course, computers sometimes go wrong. Uh, and so Bert knew he needed to have something which was just simpler than that. You know, simplicity is his key word. And apparently one night he, uh, he jumped out of bed to the surprise of his wife and uh, shouted, oh, sorry, I probably pressed the wrong button there. Can we have the next slide up? And shouted, um, shuttlecock. And uh, his wife was very surprised about that, but um, he, uh, he explained that, uh, or at least his, his thinking was that um, if you have a shuttlecock and you throw it up into the air, a couple of things happen. The first is that it'll always come down with the ball first. You know, even if it's at the top of tra the trajectory upside down, uh, it will turn itself the right way up, ball, ball first, and come, come back down. The second thing is, of course, it falls much more slowly than a tennis ball, for example. And the reason it falls more slowly is because you have these feathers uh, which act as drag or air brakes to control and slow the rate of descent. So Bert, with his sort of genius maverick mind, thought, you know, if I could somehow make my spaceship into a shuttlecock, then you know, every time we came back from, uh, the, uh, from space into the Earth's atmosphere, even if we entered the Earth's atmosphere upside down, uh, the spacecraft would turn itself the right way up. You wouldn't have to have a pilot or a computer to do that. And then possibly in the very, very upper atmosphere, you know, the feathers of my, my shuttlecock spaceship would slow my descent. So, uh, you know, we don't need heat shields, uh, we don't need to fly a trajectory, but we just use the laws of physics, the laws of nature, the air brakes of this, this shuttlecock spaceship to slow us down uh, to a velocity where it would be safe uh, to, to, to make the shuttlecock spaceship into a normal spaceship again and then fly back down to the runway. Uh, and so for those of you that are having a problem uh, sort of envisaging how you turn a spaceship into a shuttlecock, uh, that's how you do it. So this is our beautiful new spaceship, Virgin Spaceship Enterprise, uh, VSS Enterprise. Spaceship 2 uh, is the sort of generic name. And we have it here in what we call its feathered configuration. So these wings that are now standing at 60 degrees at the to the fuselage have effectively been rotated upwards. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't take too much imagination to show how that can act as a, a shuttlecock in space. So regardless of how the spaceship comes into the upper atmosphere, just the shape of the spaceship will make sure that it comes down belly first, and that's the way that we want it. And then when you're down to about 70,000 feet, you've slowed to a nice, uh, without any sort of heat shields, as I say, no special thermal protection. Those wings just very simply fold back to the original configuration, and you've got a nice light carbon fiber uh, 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 glider with six astronauts inside, um, and you've, you, you uh, circle round, glide down to the, space, uh, the spaceport. 
Uh, and so Bert Rattan um, decided that this seemed like a good idea. And you can simulate things and you can do a lot of theoretical work, but eventually you need to build it and fly it. And that's exactly what Bert did. And um, although this bit of film I'm going to show you next is, uh, is getting on a little bit now, it's 2004, um, it's still, I think, a remarkable bit of footage. And it just shows you know, what can be done uh, with very small budgets. I think this was about a $30 million budget, which, which is about the same that NASA sp spent on the space toilet for the uh, shuttle. <laughs> And uh, it was a remarkable moment. So um, uh, we sponsored that flight, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why, why we sponsored that flight in a moment. But let's just uh, play the movie now if we can and, uh, and, and watch how it all works. Good check out. The gear's on the way up. Okay. And it's up in the video. Heading cross check and data sync check to code 25. Dynamics. Scum is go for release and ignition. Elevant to go. Three, two, one. Release. Release. Fire. Fire. I've watched that video about 10,000 times and it still gets me going. It's fantastic, wasn't it? So, um, so uh, that was a fantastic day back in 2004. As you see, Virgin sponsored that flight and we had talked to Paul Allen, we'd talked to Bert Rattan before, and we said to them, look, if you manage to win the X Prize, you manage to uh, do the two flights in 14 days, which is what they needed to do into space with a man on board, bringing back safely, um, then we'd like to talk to you about commercializing this. And uh, they did that, you know, uh, Bert Rattan and the uh, Scale Composites did, I think, what only three of the world's most powerful governments had done before. Um, and it was a triumph for private enterprise um, and for entrepreneurship uh, and for a belief that things can be done better. Um, so it was one of those moments at Virgin where you seize the opportunity, it's the screw it, let's do it moment. I think there was a strong feeling that we probably wouldn't find a better opportunity to have a go at this. There certainly was no guarantee of success. Uh, but we did feel pretty confident that this basic design philosophy and the basic design had a very, very strong potential of solving these safety issues on launch and on re-entry in particular. Uh, reusability seemed to be solved. 
Um, and it looked like it could be done in a way which would make this business commercially viable, which is incredibly important, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, that's when I uh, uh, joined Virgin Galactic, um, back in 2004. And uh, the first time I met Richard and others, and uh, I got very excited about the project. And they said, look, this is going to be expensive. It's going to take some time. Um, and we really need to find out whether there are people willing to buy the product before we go too far down this, uh, down this line. So what we decided to do was to, to set up a little website. We put that film you've just watched on the website. Uh, we told people uh, that we were launching Virgin Galactic and we were going to be the world's first space line and that we were aiming to take people on fantastic trips uh, to space and back, make them astronauts as a first step in, in, in much bigger ambitions. And uh, we said, look, if you want to be part of this, you can. We don't know when the vehicle will be delivered. We don't really know what it'll look like. We don't know how long or sort of what the experience is going to be like. Uh, we don't even know whether you'll be eligible to fly. Uh, but if you want to make a reservation, then send us $200,000. And uh, we sat back a little bit nervously at that stage to see whether anybody would, uh, would respond. And we were just overwhelmed with the response. Uh, you know, the website crashed a couple of times over the weekend as we just had this flood of uh, enthusiasm, I would say, and passion from around the world of people saying, you know, this is the moment we have been waiting for. You know, if, and if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Bert Rutan and, and, and Richard Branson. And, you know, we wish you, you know, every success, which is fantastic. And it was nice to know there were thousands of people out there uh, that were behind us. And as we started looking through the registrations on the website, we also noticed uh, an increasing number that said, I want to be a part of it right now. Um, and I know how important it is for people to step up to the plate early in these projects to show some commitment in order to give you the commercial reassurance to go ahead and get it done. Um, Virgin had said, be nice if we could raise $10 million in deposits, and maybe over the next year, and I think we did it in sort of four or five weeks. It was, it was an extraordinary experience. Um, so uh, we seized the opportunity. And one of the lovely things about having an early customer base, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, is that if you listen to them and talk to them and engage to them, you end up with a much better product than you would have had uh, had you waited until it was all ready to go and then look for customers. And our customers um, started to talk to us about what they wanted from their space flight. Uh, and this is probably a good moment for to tell you, um, because you're all going to space with us uh, at some point, what you're going to get from your uh, space experience with us as well. So they said, you know, we've seen the pictures. We want a rocket ride to space. You know, we want the howl of the rocket motors. We want the G-forces. We want the thrill of hurtling away from the Earth. And uh, we said, well, yeah, we can deliver that. And because what will happen, you're sitting on the spaceship. Uh, you'll, you'll be a Spaceport America, New Mexico. You'll take off attached to this beautiful big carrier aircraft, wind up to 50,000 feet. Pilots will say, is everybody ready? You say, yes. Press the button, spaceship gets released. Little sinking feeling in your stomach as you go into a glide. Uh, then the pilots will say, everybody ready for the rocket motor? And hopefully everybody will say yes. Uh, and even if they don't, they'll probably press the button anyway. Uh, and uh, at that stage, you're, you're traveling at, I think, about 120, 130 knots. And when the rocket motor ignites behind you, uh, you accelerate with some, uh, you know, s some drama. Uh, and uh, within seven seconds, uh, you're at the speed of sound. Uh, and you keep accelerating, and as you accelerate, the pilots pitch the nose straight upwards. Uh, and over the next 30 seconds, you'll be accelerating to about four times the speed of sound. There'll be about three and a half Gs on your chest, which is a sort of a, a thrilling sensation. It's not uncomfortable. Most people can do it. Uh, and if you're able to look... <laughs> If you're able to look out of the window at that stage, you'll see the skies turning color from blue through the purple and eventually to black as you hurtle away from the surface of the Earth towards space. Uh, so we said, rocket ride to space, no problem at all. Then they said, you know, we've seen pictures of the astronauts in the space station and on the space shuttle. Uh, the zero gravity thing looks amazing, uh, and we'd love to have that. Uh, to be able to be in an environment where there's no up, no down, none of the forces that pretty much dictate everything we do, you know, to be in that environment you know, for, for, for any period of time would be just sensational. Uh, and we said, yeah, that's no problem at all, because physics dictates that there will be a period of weightlessness, uh, and you'll be nicely sat in your seat with your seatbelt on, uh, and uh, it will be fantastic. And they came back very quickly and said, no, that's, that's no good to us at all. You know, and if, if you're going to be with our seatbelts on, we want our money back. You know, this is going to be an experience uh, where we are able to leave our seats, do the somersaults, float around. And actually, you know, that was a very good lesson for, or message for us because it meant that we were very, very quickly uh, went or designed a spaceship with 
Bert Rattan, which was much bigger than the spaceship that we had originally anticipated, which isn't an easy thing to do, but it's absolutely the right thing to do because it delivers the customer experience, and this ultimately is what this business is about. Uh, so we do have a, a large cabin, and when the rocket motor switches off, when you've just got used to that you know, incredible sensation of a rocket motor right behind you, the G-forces, the acceleration, the black sky, the pilots will switch off the rocket motor, and the world inside the spaceship just tra changes dramatically, completely again. Because by this time, you're outside the Earth's atmosphere, there's no sound outside at all. We've deliberately designed the spaceship so there's no sound inside, there's no fans, there's no machinery working. Uh, and the silence of space is, is apparently awe-inspiring. But then the other thing which is probably going to sort of, over, sort of take over that feeling is that you're, you're weightless. And we have uh, fantastic seats which we're going to be unveiling for the first time uh, a little later this year. Uh, that have been specially designed to ensure that each passenger can very quickly just push away from their seats and escape into this big, big cabin uh, and have, uh, I think, a magical time of, of floating around. So we're going to be able to deliver the zero gravity experience in a way uh, that really nobody else can. I'll try once more. Doo -doo -doo. Okay. And then... I think the thing that probably was said to us by our early customers more than anything else is that, you know, we really want the rocket ride, we really want the zero gravity, but what we really, really want is to be able to get that life-changing experience of viewing the Earth from space. One of the things that's, you know, incredibly fortunate about the job that we do is that we meet a lot of astronauts, uh, a lot of professional astronauts, and uh, many of them have been to space several times. And the thing that, that really strikes you about every single one of them is that although they have been chosen specifically to do a very complex job, uh, they haven't been chosen to go and look out of the window. Uh, they uh, are government employees, they're super fit, they're super, super intelligent, whatever else. They come back and they don't talk about their space experience for a week or a month or even a year. They talk about it for the rest of their lives. And the reason they talk about it for the rest of their lives is what they saw out of the window. And there is something that happens when you're up there, when you have the blackness of space, broad daylight, uh, you look out of one of the big windows that we've provided all around the spaceship and you look down on this beautiful vista of the Earth beneath you with that thin blue line of the atmosphere a thousand miles in any direction, uh, which is profoundly moving. It changes people. I think uh, it really, for the first time, sort of properly articulates the nature of the planet that we're living on, the beauty of the planet, the fragility of the planet. Um, and I think it's going to be incredibly interesting as we fly our first, our first customers who you know, come from all around the world, uh, they tend to have a voice. Uh, they're going to come back, I think, celebrities for a little while, um, about you know, the, the, the changes and the force for good that those people will provide, having had that experience which has been available to so few in the past. And so um, we said, yes, we can provide you with that. Went back to Bert Rattan and said, make sure the windows are big. There's lots of lovely, I mean, if you ever Google it, I mean, have, have a look at what astronauts say when they come back from space, and it's, uh, it's very moving. So how are we doing? Well, we used to have to play an animation at this stage. We don't have to do that anymore because we have real spaceships, real vehicles, and have done for a number of years now. Uh, and the first vehicle that came off the production line at Scale Composites was this extraordinary looking aircraft, White Knight 2. Um, we decided to name it uh, Virgin Mothership Eve after Richard's mother. As Richard said, if you've got a mothership, you should call it after your mother. Uh, and. Uh, the real Eve will be travelling in, in, in mother, Mothership Eve uh, to uh, wave off Richard as he goes to space, uh, hopefully next year. And, uh, and it is a most remarkable aircraft. It's the, uh, the world's largest all carb carbon composite aircraft. It has a unique um, heavy lift, high altitude capability. Uh, it's the most fuel efficient aircraft of its size ever built. Uh, it can do winding G turns, it can do para parabolas, it can do all sorts of things. It's a very, very capable aircraft. Uh, that aircraft's flown about 130 times now. It's completed its test card. The pilots love it, and basically Scale got it right first time. Um, and so White Knight 2, or uh, Virgin Mothership Eve, is ready to go. But that's not all. We also, this is a slow clicker, but we also have a spaceship. Can somebody click it for me? Thank you. Uh, and we've called that Virgin Spaceship Enterprise, and it is the world's first commercial manned spaceship. Um, I've seen the spaceship quite a lot of times, uh, I've seen it fly a few times, um, and it was brought home to me just what a remarkable vehicle this is uh, on the 29th of April this year. Um, we had uh, an amazing day uh, then on, on, that, on that day, uh, because for the first time, 
All the systems in the spaceship were fully integrated. Uh, the spaceship flew, and it broke the sound barrier. Uh, and uh, it went to about 1.3, Mach 1.3, um, and it performed magnificently. And that was a big day for us, because it was really the final large piece of this jigsaw puzzle of test flight, um, and really sort of brought the reality of commercial operation very much uh, into sight. And uh, one of the guys that we employ in London, uh, his father happened to be a uh, uh, Concorde pilot, British Airways Concorde uh, captain. And, uh, uh, and he phoned his son that day and he said, you know, I've just thought of something, um, that this is only the second vehicle ever built for commercial service that has, uh, has broken the sound barrier. The first one and only one before obviously having been Concorde. And so it did really bring home to us that day, you know, just what a remarkable thing we're doing and how well it's going. And, and the flight envelope for this, this vehicle is, is enormous. Because, of course, it, first of all, it has to be a supersonic rocket plane. Uh, and that's the first of a few pictures I'll show you of the, uh, of the, 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 the uh, spaceship with the, the rocket motor firing. And that was on the 29th of April. So it's a Mach 3.5, Mach 4 vehicle. Um, and it needs to be capable of flying uh, that, that, uh, uh, that part of the flight you know, many hundreds, if not thousands, of times. But not only is it, it is a, uh, a rocket plane, it's also a high altitude glider, and those two things don't generally go together. So it needs to, to be able to fly very efficiently at very high altitude from about sort of 70,000 feet down to, the, uh, down to the ground. But not only that, uh, it also needs to be a reusable entry vehicle. Uh, and uh, of course, it also needs to be a spacecraft which is capable of keeping passengers and pilots safe in space. So the test flights, I'm oh, sorry, I've got one slide ahead here, but the test flights uh, for Spaceship 2 are also going extremely well. As I said, uh, we expect to be in space this year um, and commercial service soon thereafter. So really the last stages of this, this incredible project are, are very much in sight. The, the other amazing things that have happened with Virgin Galactic, and just a very quick, quick one um, from me, which is that uh, 2005, we had a delegation from New Mexico, um, and they came in and they said, uh, we'd like to build you a spaceport. Um, we had to look on the map, I think, to find out exactly where New Mexico was at that point. Uh, but they explained that there were a lot of good reasons why a, a spaceport, an inland spaceport, should be in New Mexico. You had altitude, you had great weather, you had deserts, uh, desert environment, you had clear airspace because of white sands, a lot of other things, and they were willing to uh, take the plunge uh, and to, to, to build a facility which we've just started to, to lease from them. And it was one of those great conversations, a little bit like the Bill uh, Allen and Juan trip conversation which led to the 747, you know, you build it, I'll buy it, you buy it, I'll build it, uh, between Richard and the governor there, Bill Richardson at the time, uh, and the conversation was a little bit, uh, you know, if you build me a spaceport, I'll build you a spaceship, uh, and then, okay, well, if you build me a spaceship, I'll build you a spaceport. And the reason I like that photo particularly was because you see the two people that had that conversation standing in front of the spaceport with the spaceship flying overhead. Uh, and it just shows what can be done, you know, given the will. Um, let me just finish, and I'm going to hand over to somebody else just for a few moments, but just, just one of our, I think our oldest customer, Professor James Lovelock, who is... Uh, is 92 now. He's been on the centrifuge. He can do the G's, looking forward to going to space. Uh, has described Virgin Galactic as one of the most important industrial projects of the 21st century, which is a very big statement. But I think he, Stephen Hawking, and, and other, other people sort of really recognize the importance of this first step. And what uh, they all understand is that space really, really matters and is only going to matter more and more to us as we try to manage you know, the, the really major challenges of, uh, of, of coping with a, a population of 8, 9, 10 billion uh, you know, in the coming years. And I think what they also recognize is that government technology often gets things off to a good start. You know, it did it with the internet, it did it with mobile telephony, it did it with, in other areas. Uh, and without government technology, we wouldn't be in space at all. Um, uh, and, but what they also recognize is that, uh, that it takes the private sector in those industries really to, to push the pace of change and innovation. And again, we've seen it, of course, in mobile telephony and with Virgin Galactic, we're starting to see it in space. So what is Galactic going to be about? Well, the first part of our business we could perhaps call Virgin Galactic Space Tours. Uh, we're going to start uh, that very soon. We're going to continue to take people on short flights, then longer flights. We're going to go orbital. We may go to the moon. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, you take a step at a time. We've got to prove that you can take people to space safely on a daily basis. We've got to prove that we can do that in a commercially viable, uh, a commercially viable way. And that part of the business is going incredibly well. Um, I have somebody in the audience with me this afternoon, uh, Dave Clark, um, who has the world record, actually, for 
selling more space tickets than anybody else, I think, probably. <laughs> uh, Thank so. you very much. Thank you very much for having us, everybody. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because at breakfast this morning, Richard said he was going to jeer us, and he hasn't so far, so <laughs> like something might be coming. Um, well, I'd like to talk just for a moment, and I realize we only have a, a few minutes left about, uh, Stephen's explained the development of the business, uh, and I w just wanted to speak quickly about a somewhat unexpected bonus of this project, which was our community of future astronauts. So we started with a few that signed on very quickly that were there in 2004, 2005, and we've just been growing at an ever-expanding rate ever since. <clears throat> and these people, we figured out very quickly, didn't want just to sign on, buy a ticket, wait a few years, get a phone call, show up at the spaceport and fly to space. They wanted to get involved. They wanted to be a part of every part of the project, helping us to design the spaceship so it was the experience that they wanted. They also wanted to get to know each other because this was not, not just any group of people. This was the most exclusive group in the world of these early adopters who had the pioneering spirit to become the first civilian astronauts. And I think we've done uh, as much as we can, and it's, the community has really taken off. Uh, so we do, we actually just came from Necker Island, uh, Richard's private island in the Caribbean, where we do about three trips with the future astronauts a year. We also, they've begun training, so they've done centrifuge training to experience the G-forces, as well as zero gravity, parabolic flights to experience the weightlessness. And we learn a lot from these people. So it's not just signing up and waiting for your ticket. It's they're involved. We probably do something every month or two. And these people have really developed the uh, program along with us. And we actually have a few of the future astronauts in the room with us today. We have uh, Kelly Smith, uh, Richard Branson, uh, his assistant Helen, who he never leaves behind, so I'm sure she'll be there too. Um, and uh, we also have Dick and Heidi Bloom, who I understand signed up in the last 24 hours, so congratulations to them. Uh, I realize that we're short on time, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, I realize we're short on time, so I'll stick around here after, and if anybody would like to learn more about joining this community of future astronauts and becoming one of the first people to leave the planet themselves, then uh, please let us know, and we'd love to tell you more about it. Thanks again for having us. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and that's not where the business ends, though. I think the next part of the business we're going to see is what we might call galactic science services. Uh, and so this is using the spaceship as a research platform for scientists. Uh, our first customer for that part of the business is, funnily enough, NASA. Uh, so uh, they have recognized very early on um, that uh, you know, this vehicle, the private sector, can actually help them do what they need to do better than they do it already. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, we were very aware that all our airlines have a cargo department. and. We thought that the space line should have a cargo department as well. And so last year, uh, we announced something we're calling Launcher One. Uh, and this is an incredibly exciting business it's in, in its own right. Um, we were talking to somebody at lunch the other day that was talking about the fact that, you know, the weather satellites, Earth imaging satellites, satellites that tell us about weather, tell us about climate change, help us to, uh, to manage extreme weather events, those sort of things, those satellites are coming to their end of their lives and they're not being replaced. Um, they're very expensive, or at least previously have been very expensive, but there are companies around the world that are just making smaller, smarter, cheaper satellites. Satellites that can be, have a far, uh, shorter shelf life, can be renewed more regularly, so you're always up to date with, the, uh, with the, the technology. The big problem, of course, is getting them into space, and that's uh, our opportunity. And by using the, the uh, White Knight 2 aircraft, by using uh, uh, an air-launched um, small satellite delivery system, uh, we can absolutely transform small satellites, uh, the small satellite world. Um, we can launch just about anywhere with a runway, uh, at the, 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 client's, uh, the client's request, we can launch at very, very short notice, and we can launch many, many satellites over a very short period of time. So this vehicle is funded, it's being developed right now, and we expect to see it launching its first satellites uh, you know, in, the, in, in, the next, in the next year or two. Um, so this, again, is a very exciting part of the business, which is complementing you know, the man side of the, of the space business, whether that's for space tours, for people that just want to do it for themselves, or for science research. Now, the other thing that we're always encouraged to do at Virgin is to, you know, is to, is to dream a little bit. You know, most of the time you have to concentrate on the day job, but dreaming is, is, is a great thing to do as well. Uh, a lot of us travel around the world, and although you know, traveling on Virgin has made it as good as ever, you know, ever going to be, it's still pretty slow. Uh, and thinking about, you know, what is the real successor to, to, to Concorde? Um, it's probably not going to be, well, it could be, probably not going to be a supersonic large plane. Um, the future is probably point-to-point -point travel, transcontinental travel via space. 
Um, and if, again, we're able to develop our first steps in taking people to space safely, um, showing we can uh, do it in a commercially viable way, then uh, thinking about uh, developing these vehicles so they don't come back down in the same place that they left, but they actually start to go downrange. And maybe it's just a little bit downrange, first of all, and then we build it up until we can see, again, in the future, that you could be traveling potentially on uh, something like this, um, which would get you from uh, London to Sydney uh, in maybe two and a half hours. And then you've got to queue for two and a half hours to get into the country, but... <laughs> So um, that's pretty much it for me. I want to, uh, to, to just play one final little film which shows a bit of our, our supersonic flight uh, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for some questions. So uh, can we play the final movie, please? I'd seen the moon landing as a young boy. And I just thought, you know, one day I'm, I'm going to do that. But years by year went by and uh, NASA didn't seem to be that interested in getting you or me into space. And, um, and so in about 1990, I suddenly thought, Virgin Galactic sounds like a good name. And uh, so having registered the name Virgin Galactic, I had to do something about it. <laughs> To be perfectly honest, I think it would be very sad for anybody not to want to go to space. I mean, if you're inquisitive about life and inquisitive about the world around us, you just, you know, to be able to look back at our fragile Earth from space and see the beauty of it is something that I'm sure that every, every single one of us would love to do if we had the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening and um, uh, Dave you should come up probably as well and if there are any questions we'd be, be delighted to answer them. Um, sorry yes you were first thank you. Do we have a microphone? Oh Dave's got it. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. Um, I want to commend you for some incredible work. The, I'm on an institute called the Overview Institute that studies the cognitive impacts of seeing the Earth from space okay. from astronauts. It's profoundly life transforming for people. So the work you're doing is incredible. But I wanted to ask you about the paradox of what's going on with the, the simulations that have been run at the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder with regards to the black carbon in the stratosphere. Um, that by their simulations this could Potentially, if you achieve the numbers of a thousand flights a year, uh, raise 
polar temperatures by a degree Celsius. And I know that you're working on extraordinary advancements within the propulsion technologies, within the weight of the carbon composites and everything else. But it's a, it's a very serious concern amongst some atmospheric sciences that we're doing a kind of an uncontrolled uh, geoengineering experiment with space tourism. And so I was wondering if you could respond to that and how it is that you're seeing so the sort of paradoxical integration of understanding the planet as a whole system yep. and understanding that we have a very sensitive biosphere right now that needs to be preserved for future generations. Absolutely. I mean, and it's, it's, uh, it's a, really, a really good question. I, think, I mean, the, fir the first thing to say, and I, before I address that specific point, is that, that this is um, by a, a, a huge factor, sort of a, a cleaner space system or cleanest space system that has ever been designed, which doesn't mean that it's completely clean, that there isn't any impact, but it's a, it's a huge improvement. Um, the specific issue that you mentioned is, is a very involved one. Uh, there's uh, a, a, a not much research on it yet, and we need to understand the, the, the true sort of the, the true story. Um, and we're doing a lot of work, and we will continue to do a lot of work as we as we start to fly to to really understand what that impact is. Um, whatever the impact is, it really is is only I think a problem once you start to see this industry um, sort of really take off and so, so, and so it's not going to be an initial issue and I think, but I think the other thing is that we're working really hard now on just making propulsion systems cleaner and cleaner and I think we will see there will be developments in the propulsion system which I think will eventually or you know, hopefully over the fairly near term just take away this problem. Um, you know the rocket motor that we're starting from with is, is, is great you know it does the, does the job very efficiently very safely um, but uh, you know we will see rapid evolution and we'll be tracking this very carefully and you know the science at the moment is pretty uncertain on the exact impact. Yes. Oh, sorry. I've... Thank you. It was uh, fascinating what you presented. Three quick questions. Um, obviously, this is going to, you've had already prototypes going up successfully. How long are the flights going to be? What are you going to be doing to control temperature with the variances in there? And last but not least, is there going to be any toilet room there. Um, Dave? Right, yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, firstly, how long will the flight be? Uh, passengers or the future astronauts will show up with five friends uh, three days before their flight, so there'll be three days training and preparation, uh, and the space flight will take place in the morning of the fourth day. And from takeoff to touchdown, it's about two and a half hours. Uh, the second question was about temperature control. Uh, the spaceship is a double skin, um, and it, it'll be a shirt sleeves environment, so you won't require any kind of clothing or extra um, uh, materials to help you maintain the temperature, uh, and, and it should be comfortable. There's inside. not much variance, actually, for, for, for this for, for a supper flight. So it's, and it's um, we didn't have space for, for a, a loo, but um, uh, if you are worried about it, we can give you a diaper. <laughs> Everybody happy with that? <laughs> uh, sorry, the lady here has had her hand up very patiently. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say, Mr. Branson, you have served as an inspiration to me for the past 20 years as an explorer, a visionary, and a philanthropist. So thank you for that. And, uh, And I was and continue to be a big fan of Steve Fawcett's as well. So um, my question is, how many people do you have signed up currently? And is there a screening process that you put them through, a physical or mental screening process? So we have, um, we were very excited last year because we, had, we signed up our 528th future astronaut, which means that we have more people signed up to fly with Virgin Galactic than have ever been to space in history. Uh, we now have blown past that and we're about to sign up our 650th future astronaut. Uh, we, uh, we do look for, we speak with every astronaut, it's a very personal onboarding process, uh, and if they are concerned about certain medical issues and we raise the ones that could be an issue, uh, we can discuss those and we also have a chief medical officer that's worked with NASA and also works with us. Uh, as long as you don't have a major heart condition that hasn't been dealt with, you should have no problems flying to space with us. Uh, to prove that uh, the market of our future astronauts was capable of flying to space, we took our first hundred, our founding astronauts who signed up, and we put them on a centrifuge facility in uh, Philadelphia, and we could exactly replicate the G 
profile of our space flight, and that's the G's 3.5 GZ or GZ uh, on launch, which goes from your head down, and then 6 GX on re-entry, which goes from your chest through to your back. And uh, pretty much everybody performed brilliantly on the uh, on the centrifuge, which proves that our market of future astronauts, which is not like the astronauts that NASA recruits, these are uh, different shaped, different aged <laughs> people, uh, but they're still absolutely capable of flying to space with us. We actually had a funny conversation with um, the managing director of Virgin Active, which are the gyms, and they, I think we worked out that we could fly a higher percentage of people to space than they could accept as members of their gyms. I think they had a lot of people on New Year's Day deciding it was time to start running, and they said, not, not here. <laughs> I think these guys are in. Okay. Great. Obviously, as a version as a commercial enterprise is really important. I think both for Michael's generation and for mine, you know, Sir Richard Branson has been a huge cultural icon for a lot of us and inspiration. Obviously, you guys are going to worry about the economics of making this all work as well, but is there something with the launch next year to sort of inspire a new generation of technology and science interest, both educationally but also just yep. worldwide? Yeah, it's a great, great question, and I think we have uh, Maya at the back of the room. Stand up, Maya. Um, so we were, uh, very quick, quick story, we, we were down on Necker Island uh, with some astronauts a few years ago. Somebody said, look, this growing community is incredible. You know, people, there's so many skills, you know, really, really amazing people. Why don't we try and just bring this community together and just do something, you know, let's do something for good. Um, and Richard said, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, we have uh, an organization with Virgin, uh, within Virgin called Virgin Unite, um, and I'll sort of give you that, if you like, as the framework, you take it and decide what you want to do as a community. And the community very quickly decided that they would like to use the inspiration of, of space uh, to inspire students to study and pursue careers in science, technology, engineering and maths with a sort of entrepreneurial and uh, environmental uh, overlay. And um, Maya, who joined us uh, a, a a couple of years ago, uh, has been running that for us, uh, and it is really starting to take off. Um, uh, so we uh, now have um, some of our future astronauts have sponsored students, for example, so there's a scholar scholarship program which is going around the world, and it's going to get big, bigger and better, and I think by the time we, you know, we get into commercial launch, we're going to have some really lovely schemes going, which means that we can use this spaceship to, to inspire teachers, to inspire students, and to, to frankly, you know, give us the people that we need in the future uh, as Virgin Galactic to take you to the moon or whatever it is. Um, so uh, we're absolutely uh, aware of that and our future, our future astronaut customers are a fabulous resource and they, 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 they want to play their part. I think we're about half past, aren't we? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, well thank, thank you very you. much again. Thank you. Great job. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Really thank great, you, Joe. Really great. Thank you.